one of my absolute heroes. And Very kind. I have uh, I've stolen. I told this to Mark Diglio of XYZ, who I recently interviewed, and he, kind of the first one he had done in 35 years. I said, with the exception of Dan Huff and Michael Landau, you three are the ones I've stolen the most from. So thank you very much. Uh, all the licks and phrasing and styling. And uh, I'm just an absolutely huge fan. So this is a bucket list moment for me. Mr. Dan Huff, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. It's a, it's a pleasure. And, and I'll join you in the, uh, the uh, stealing, the thief of licks that I'm, I would be chief amongst the <laughs> plagiarize every 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 aspect i mean we all i mean it's, it, that's what it is right you hear something yep. that you absolutely that resonates with you and and you you want to incorporate it and you know the first the first uh, you know when i when i uh, kind of was coming into my own probably in my early 20s may, maybe late teens the the guy that i mean i i copied two or three people specifically um, but the guy that really was probably the most influential as far as studio playing was Steve Lukather. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I was a Steve Lukather clone. I mean, you know, for years, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't, Steve and I are good friends. So I'm assuming he, he doesn't hold that grudge, but you know, when somebody sets, somebody sets the bar for something and you're trying to, uh, break in, be, be accepted and be, be, uh, you know, hired based on, you know, what is, what is the bar, what the bar is at that time, you have to go to the best. I mean, obviously I had a lot of other influences and, and you mentioned another great influence of mine, Mike Landau, who, who I got the pleasure of, I did I, I countless sessions with him in Los Angeles. And I mean, you know, I'm sitting there, I got hired to, to, to do my job and play, but <laughs> I'm getting paid really good money to basically sit next to this genius guitar player and, 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 uh, and cop all of his licks too. So anyway, <laughs> enough said about that. You get the idea. No, a hundred percent. And I, and I, I wanted to explain something and I've always wanted to tell you this and Mike sure. this and St and Luke this. Yeah. What you guys may not understand, and I know you recently did an interview with uh, Mason and, and some others, but at so my age group, I'm 41, mm -hmm. and I started playing piano at four, guitar at seven. So now mm -hmm. let's do the math. We're talking about mid to late 80s. I am now getting into music, and I'm full-throated into it as a, as a child, as a young person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's so I tell people all the time, music moves so fast and there was such a change and there was such a movement of it between, say, 1980 and 1995. As much as Jimi Hendrix and Stevie Ray Vaughan being from Dallas originally and and Terry Kath of Chicago and all these guys were my influences. Right. You guys session work because it was on the radio and you would have a ballad and all of a sudden this amazing, you know, Solo would come out that doesn't sound like my practice amp. I always wanted to tell you guys, there's a big round of thanks because I, I talked to a lot of guitarists like, well, I grew up listening to Jimmy Page. And you can always associate those guys with a band. Sure. For me, and I, it was a lot of it with Giant, too. But, I mean, just the stuff that you did or Mike did or Luke did or Michael Thompson or Paul Jackson Jr. Or this was stuff that was Every time I was in a car, I could hear you guys. So it's an interesting right. time period in that mm -hmm. you guys were just as big an influence as Hendrix was or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, somebody of that nature that we all call upon when we talk about rock leg legends. So mm -hmm. I just think that's it. I don't know how much you guys think about it. I don't know if you're like, why are these guys copying so much stuff all over the Internet? But that really is, is that you guys shaped us just as much as the guitarist that we associate with the who or Led Zeppelin or, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's the fabric of this entire generation of guitar players. Uh, well, I mean, specific, I tell you how I think about it. I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, first of all, that's, uh, thank you. I mean, that's, that's, that's a wonderful compliment. And, and I accept that on top of that. I mean, it's, I have total imposter syndrome because <laughs> I don't, I don't view, you know, I mean, I don't view myself that way. I mean, there's no way I could because of the people, when I when I was in that same formative stage, it, it, in 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 for me that was the late that was no it was the mid seventies. Mm -hmm. um, oh, actually, I should say all of the seventies. But but when I, I was born in nineteen sixty, so you know when I really started dedicating hours upon hours a day, thirteen, fourteen, let's say, that was the time when um, Larry Carlton was putting out his solo records. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was a big Al Demiola fan. Elegant Gypsy was a real, you know, there there were no, um, first of all, there were no Eddie Van Halens. There were no Steve Vyse. There, were, there was nobody playing with that speed and that cleanliness that Al Di mm-hmm. was doing. Not, I, I didn't know anybody. And, um, but then I had, on the other hand, I was, I was in love with this band from New York called stuff. And I don't know if you know, you know, Eric Gale and Cornell Dupree were the guitar yes. players. I mean, it was a great band. Steve Gadd was in the band and Bernard, I think Bernard Edwards. No, no, it wasn't Bernard Edwards. Anyway, um, Richard T was the piano player, but the, uh, Gordon Edwards was the bass player. So I had those two things. I was I became very aware of Ray Parker Jr. at that time because mm. of a of a Boz Skaggs record came out probably seventy seven or seventy eight. Um, yep. I mentioned Larry Carlton, Lee Rittenhour's Captain's Journey had just come out. So I was I was feasting on these things. I mean, it was like oh, and also um, Asia. Oh yeah, the Steely Dan yeah. record. So, yeah. so and, yeah. you know, well, most of those guitar players played on that. So that was that was my informative period. Uh, it was you know all we had was record players at that point. So needle dropping just ad nauseum. I, I became a specialist in how to you know get within the groove. You know, um, yeah. and then at the end of this 70s, 78 or seventy nine, you probably know better than than me. Then this this group Toto came out. Mm-hmm. And that was, you know, that was, that was about, that was where, that was, I loved the way Steve played. It, it, it was a bit more rock and roll than, than um, Larry Carlton or Lee Rittenauer, but he had the same melodic sensibilities and such a singing vibrato. That was where I was taken off because I was, you know, mm-hmm. 19 at that time. So mm-hmm. all that stuff, I mean, for me, I forgot also another magical influence for me. At that time, because because of it, I was in high school, it was the blow by blow and wired record. I, oh, I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. And, it, and, and so, so a friend of mine, Gordon Kennedy, who's a wonderful guitar player, he's been one of my dearest friends since I was in high school. We were at this little sports academy high school. We had a music teacher who was so he was he was so sensitive to, to our needs. We didn't have much of a music program there. So what he would do is he'd said, "Look, as long as you guys keep up your grades, we will. I'll let you go and practice your guitars uh, during study hall." Nice. So we did. So we would go back to the chorus room, put on those records that we were talking about, and just learn all the part. Boston came out then. So mm-hmm. Tom Schultz. So we had this massive just just repertoire of music that we 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 were learning as young guitar players. And um, those are the people who I have stars in my eyes. Like the first time I met any of these guys, you know, I was, yeah. my hands were shaking, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And so when you mention, you know, when, when you get mentioned kind of, you know, in that, in that it's, it's on one hand, like for you to say that, I, I, I understand what you're saying because you were hearing stuff that, that I was doing and, and all the guys that you mentioned, but I don't think of myself like that. <laughs> all I can hear every time I play a guitar, every time I pick up a guitar, and I play anything to this day, all I hear is who I'm emulating. Well, that's the same for me. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you and Mike and yeah. like consistently music for you. The first time you knew you were going to play guitar, your dad, obviously massively influential in terms of having a household with music, with his mm-hmm. amazing career. Yeah. Was it your dad? Was he the biggest influence for you and David to be like, we're going to play instruments. I mean, how, or, or when was the first time you decided, Hey, I'm going to pick up a guitar. I really want to play guitar. Probably at 10 or 11, it was an acoustic guitar. Yeah. Um, you, you know, it's, it's funny as, as far as the question of my biggest, probably my biggest influence in my life was my, was my dad. He was, he, you know, um, he died about five years ago, actually this month. So, um, mm. he was best man in all three of his son's weddings, which I think is, Pretty remarkable. So cool. That says something about the relationship. Um, he he wasn't. Um, the, the irony is because he was a professional musician. My mother was a fantastic um, classical pianist. Mm. Still is actually. She can read the phone book. You know, just they they were so hands off about music. Mm. Interesting. I mean, I, I think I think when we lived out in Denver when I was probably ten or nine, we, I, we had to take piano lessons. That was that was about the extent of it. You know, you have to take piano lessons for a year. Yep. So beyond that, um, 
it, it, it was when we got back to Nashville. I think it was just the fact that I had access to go to the recording studios and watch guitar players. He was my dad was really gracious about taking me uh, whenever I wanted to go and sit in, in, in a, and watch a recording session. And I think he he sensed um, that he wasn't. I was pretty self. Uh, uh, pretty much a self-starter. Um, mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, later in my high school years, I, I asked him, I said, well, you know, why didn't you make me study more? And he's, his reply, best I can remember was, is that you were so obsessed with it that I felt like my job at this point was to round, keep you rounded, open as many doors until you slam them shut. So it, it was, it was always sports, academics, and, uh, but he never, he never, um, they let me play when I was in high school. There was a, a college, you know, well, you, you lived in Nashville, so you know Belmont University, yeah. Yeah. which is, they had a studio. It was called Belmont College back then. And um, I, I was, as long as I kept my grades up, uh, a bunch of college players f- found out that I was pretty good. And so I, th- my dad would let me uh, do all night sessions and, f- you know, in that free studio. And as long as I kept my grades up mm. and, uh, you know, so, so, so it was pretty much, um, music was never really a big topic in our house. Isn't that weird? That is we weird. Just, interesting. We, but it was it was nonstop. And here's another thing I'll say. And the last thing I'll say about my dad, because you get me going down that rabbit hole. And, no, uh, keep it coming, man. I love he, it. He's a he, he he's an orchestrator. He was an orchestrator, and so uh, he he was a piano player. And, and so the, he would always have some kind of piano, whether it was electric piano or grand piano. Have his big staff paper, and you know he he would hit hit the chords or whatever just for reference, and then and then scribble stuff on the pad. And when when we were growing up, he I remember he would have a, he had a little portable. I think it was a black and white television. He would place right next to him and just mm. crank it up full blast. Mm. You know, I mean, not distorting, but it was loud to drown out my guitar amps in the in the basement and my brother David playing drums. So how he did that, you know, it is pretty amazing. But so there was music, and 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 when we were young, my mom was teaching piano, so there was stuff going on all the time. But. Where the guitar came from, I have no idea. It, it just it just was kind of a thing. And same thing with my brother would say about drums. Yeah, I was curious if he just yeah, that was an interesting. They just they just but they never stopped us and they encouraged us, but they never pushed us in it. You know, I'm curious to ask you this. I'm just going to pause in the timeline. How did you? I always love to ask guitarists this, especially my heroes. How do you visualize? Like when you were learning, how did you visualize? We all visualize the fretboard differently. You know, some people talk about shapes and patterns and yeah. refining tonics and finding the note and this and learning the pentatonic and, oh, I'm trapped in this. And how did you first learn the fretboard and how do you to this day, I guess over the years into this day, look at it from a theory standpoint? Were you a heavy theory guy? Were you a mm-hmm. ear guy? Were I mean, what when you sit down to write a solo, were you looking going... I jumped into the Dorian mode or was it really more like, no, this sounds good on this. I don't know what it's called because I think I hear that more often than I do, you know, the, the heavy theory stuff. I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, just the, the, the last thing you said, uh, it wasn't a rejection of, of any kind of education. I just wasn't, well, the irony, both of my parents have pr- had perfect pitch. Mm. Um, I didn't. <laughs> so, um, and, and they, they both could, read anything. My mm-hmm. reading was so marginal. It was more about, um, you know, it was just hearing things that, 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 you know, resonated and then mm-hmm. wanting to figure out how to play that. And, you know, I mean, so it was always, it, I didn't know the, the scales per se. I mean, I knew enough theory. I think I took one year of theory in college and that was the only music course that I ever took, um, or that I ever completed, I guess. Uh, it was it was all about the ear and mm. and again not 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 proudly with that I mean it, it was a good thing for a guitar players As a matter of fact when I I think I was 20 years old and, and or 21 and I was getting ready to move out to the west coast and uh, the person that was trying to get me to come out it was a real famous keyboard player a ranger named Robbie Buchanan and he was pretty much doing almost all the records out in LA and I, I remember having a phone call with him and I said, Robbie, you know, I probably should take another year and really get my reading chops together. And he just said, he said, uh, nah, you probably not. He said, you know, he said, for what you do, people just want that. 
Mm. And, you know, the reading thing, he said, you know, it's, it's helpful, but it's not, it's not incumbent that you are a good reader. And, and consequently, I just, my boot scooted out there and <laughs> I got myself into some situations that, you know, on, on sound stages, um, TV or movie film scores that I would just run on breaks over to the brass section and say, can you hum this to me? Uh-huh. Um, because yeah. I was a, I was a, I, I mean, I could read like remedial stuff, but I mean, the mm-hmm. stuff that, that was in front of me, nah, there were other guitar players that could handle that. And I learned how to fake my way around it. As soon as I got a little more confidence, it wasn't a big deal. Getting back to your question, it was just melody always got me. And then I mm-hmm. probably because I was around string players all the time because my dad, I, I love the, the way that, um, you know, the, the, the glissandos, the way string players would play them. And I, I, I guess that kind of found a place in my musical soul. So when I learned how to, was learning how to play a little bit faster, it wasn't a kind of a mathematical type thing. I didn't mm-hmm. respond as much to just, you know, picking every note. I, I kind of went towards what I heard, which was kind of that slurring type style. So mm-hmm. I, I developed a, you know, my technique, you know, whatever my technique is, um, that would, basically allow me to play kind of what I heard. And and that was about it. It, w- it really wasn't a heck of a lot more than that, you know? Well, you're, you're pre- preaching to somebody who's the same way. I started on the piano. So when I think of theory, I still think of black and white keys and here and this and that. Yeah. When I'm on the guitar, it's separate. It's all ear. And I learned the piano by ear originally, too. Mm-hmm. So I, you're preaching to me. It's like I had to learn it backwards, meaning like, what did mm-hmm. I just – tell me what I just played. I liked it. What was it? Right. You know, like that was the – so then one more technique question, and then I want to get sure. to your move to Los Angeles. Sure. Michael Nielsen, had, uh, who's got a big YouTube channel and huge fan of yours as well, he had a great quote once about your playing, and I was like, this is, this is dead on accurate. We were talking about guitarists that are fast mm-hmm. and guitarists that are quick. And he, he put it that way. And I'm like, no, you're right. Dan's quick because I can hear every note. And I don't know where Dan got that. I'm curious, like, how did you build speed and the quickness of the notes? Where did that come from? Like your just your technique of when you needed to play fast or go into tapping versus just having like was speed something that just came naturally or did you work at it? Oh, no, I had to work at it. I was intrigued. You know, it was, I was intrigued by the use of of speed to to give tension to a, a melody like mm. the idea of, of it, it, it never i mean i listened back to some of the stuff i did in the 80s and, and some of it i'm a little like you know to say embarrassed that sounds a little bit judgmental i mean some of it some of it when i hear it was gratuitously fast I and mean, i could never stop but that was also kind of that was the currency of the day so i'm gonna give sure. myself a little break but but in the stuff that I hear, there are certain things I've, I've, I've played that I, I'll hear back and, and I'll go, yeah, that's kind of what I meant. And it, it, speed was always a way to to kind of harness and, 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 and use it emotionally to get from one point to the next point without without staying on it too much. And mm. so, so the fluidity really mattered to me um, in, in the way. And so... But in answer to your question, yeah, I just I just practiced really hard. I mean, I used to play eight to ten hours a day when I was in high school, mm. you know, as much as I possibly could. And so you kind of learn the tricks. I mean, I, I don't think my tip picking technique is really all that great. I mean, I hold a pick like this. My fingers touch the fr- fretboard. I mean, it's it's it looks kind of ugly. I, I see these players who just do this, and I wish I could do that, but I, I don't do it like that, you know, yeah. and because I had a I was equally as intrigued with rhythm playing and that mm-hmm. that was a that if you want to talk about the that yeah. in, in regard to los angeles um going back to the ray parker jr i was mm-hmm. apps i was equally as taken with the space between his playing mm. obviously the 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 certainty of where it was coming, all that kind of stuff, all that i was trying to figure out ways to do both of those things i didn't want to mm-hmm. be just a lead player yeah and I didn't want to be just a rhythm player. So all, I think everything kind of fed into me at one point. And it just, you know, it kind of informed what I do. I mean, there's a lot of holes in what I do, too. But you you play to your strengths, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, hopefully get some kind of voice in what you're doing. So all that stuff is 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 in there. I mean, I still work at it. I don't play as, as um, fast 
all the time as I used to, but every once in a while, it's funny, there's a lot of records that I'm, that I'm producing these days. And these younger artists are now getting really, uh -huh. they're, they're intrigued by the eighties. So they want some of that stuff. Yes, so I have do. to kind of pull out the old, you know, the old technique and do it. And hey, this, I still got a, I still got a few tricks up my belt. Not as it, it doesn't come quite as easily. I'll say that much. Well, if you could share a secret with us, was it like pick, pick, hammer on, pick, pick, hammer on? Because we all have tricks to go a little faster. You know what I mean? Did you ever develop something where it's like, ooh, if I do this, I can actually go a little faster versus picking every note or alternate picking? Did you ever think about that? Like, ooh, this is a style that works for me or didn't think was about it. Ever that? Okay. But it, is, but it is what you just mentioned. I mean, it, it, when some uh, somebody like would point it out and you sit there and realize – that you're not picking every note. I mean, it wasn't as thought out as that premeditated would be yeah. kind of the word. No, it's just, it's just, you know, you hear it. I think string players affected me more than anything. Mm. Or saxophone. I used to listen a lot to David Sanborn. Yeah, me and too. And the way he would gliss up and 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 do that. So that really affected me. But 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 going back to what I said about yeah, Al Di Miola, I mean, I don't think I ever figured out that lick on race with the devil on the Spanish highway. You know that track? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I ever learned it, but that clarity intrigued me. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that I didn't, I didn't probably have the patience to learn it a hundred percent, but it, it got into my brain. And so, mm -hmm. so the, the thing that I will say that I was, that I, that when I started recording and I could hear myself back on things, I was absolutely obsessed with it sounding fluid. So I would do anything to get it to that point. So, you know, when I'm sitting there playing, you know, as I'm picking, I, I it probably sounded better with a hammer in between all the picking notes, you know, so that's yeah. why that came. Yeah. It's just cool. I just love to hear it because it's like, sometimes I can, now we've got the technology. I can isolate you sometimes, which is helpful. And yeah. I can be like, Oh, what was that? And then it's like the hammer on is so clear as I'm tabbing this for people. And by the way, to your point, what's really fun about doing what I've done is having 70, 80, 90 pieces of sheet music of a solo that you did or Mike did or whatever mm -hmm. is hearing kids that are 17, 18, 19 years old going, I never knew this existed. And now I'm hooked and they really mm -hmm. are. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's, that's so much fun for me because they're getting the same influence that I did. But I just was curious because as I'm doing those things, I'm always wondering, like, it was so clear that it could have been a pick note all the way through, you know, it mm -hmm. could have been three in a row or it may not have been. But so I, I, I thought that was, I was always wanted to ask you that. I just thought that was something it was always on my mind moving to Los Angeles now. And I want to get to the 63 strat, but when you moved out there, did you start doing sessions right away? Can you tell me the order in which white heart happened yeah. and you doing sessions? Like were they running at the same time or like, I guess what happened day one when you, when you landed in LA, the White Heart was emanated out of uh, some friends I met right out of high school, and I was touring with a with an artist named Bill Gaither, mm. and and we met in that and it was very different music from what I was doing, but he just a wonderful man. He and his wife Gloria, um, they were they were playing arenas then, and and uh, so it was just a it was it was just a good way, you know, for me to get my first job. Really, mm -hmm. up to that point, I. I'd done I'd done some demos in high school, but that was about it. And then Christian music at that time was was kind of you know there was a real cutting edge thing. There was a real freedom about it. So a, a few of those guys that I met, we formed a group and recorded. And I, I, it was here's a weird thing. I mean, full disclosure, I was raised in in kind of the evangelical Christian world. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have this burning desire to go out and and you know proselytize for it. But Christian music was that we just was there. Right. And I, mm -hmm. I was raised mm -hmm. in it. So, so we start, we started this band and got to do some records, but the second that I had a, a chance and this it's kind of a jumbled story. I, I was doing, you know, 19 years old, 20, I was starting to do demos in Nashville, mm. but then what happened is a, a few people heard, you know, this is traditionally what happened. Somebody would hear a demo and they would, they'd say who played the guitar on that, or they'd get to a session and, and whoever was trying to duplicate it, if they wanted that thing, couldn't. So that led to who is that? Let's get him. Mm. And uh, Nashville at that time was not, shall we say, a real friendly town all in all to somebody who played like the way I played. Mm. It was settle down young and, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> I wasn't very settled. But so what came up were a couple of, you know, master recording sessions. And 
And um, there was a record by a guy named Greg Guidry, G-U-I-D-R-Y. And anyway, it, it, it was David Hungate from Toto who just moved to Nashville. I get to play with him. Mm. And he, he was the one, he said, basically, he said, if you really want to make it as a guitar player, you got to go to the West Coast. Mm. So through another record, I think it was a Lou Rawls record, was the, I don't think, I know it was a Lou Rawls record. I was playing on a Lou Rawls record. He was recording in Nashville. The producer, Ronnie Hafkin, was out in L.A. overdubbing Robbie Buchanan, this mm. keyboard whiz. Yeah. He became one of my best friends. And, and um, he asked the question, who's playing guitar on this? And so it was that was that one thing. Wow. Well, that got reported back to me. A phone call ensued, and, and he, Robbie said, you know, you know, Steve Luger is kind of dropping out of the scene here because he's got this band. And there's a, you know, there's, there's definitely some real estate you could, you could cash in on here. That was it. I just gotten married. Uh, Sherry and I were like junior high sweethearts and uh, she was game to go out to LA. So we, we didn't have much and we, we drove out there. I was still in Whiteheart. So I'm coming around to your question. And, but the second I had a chance to do this, it was like, see yeah. ya. I mean, yeah. it was just, it was not, I didn't want to be on the road. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. And uh, so the, 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 you know, I'm still friends with the guys from that era of the band, but they weren't, they were none too happy with me. And um, <laughs> they probably worried about my eternal soul at that point, but that wasn't, that wasn't the problem. Um, and the, the irony is that the guy I mentioned earlier, Gordon Kennedy ended up taking the spot spot. And I think they became way better than, than when I was in the band. Interesting. Um, so, Interesting. so, you know, things have a way of kind of working themselves out, but, or at least they made better records at that time. So, so basically, yeah, 20, probably the end of my 21st year, we were out there uh, living up in a little duplex and, and um, I don't know, it's probably about a month and I started getting all these calls. So wow. go, fig go figure that. I mean, I would, I'd put that firmly in the, uh, I'd say, massive amount of luck, mm. um, you know, right place, right time. And also to the degree that I had really uh, prepared myself. So every situation I got in, it worked. So yeah. so, so I, I can take some of the credit, but I won't take all the credit. Boy, here's the other little nuance to that. Before we moved out there, this is back in the time when the artists didn't call directly. Even the producers didn't call directly. They were they were they had contractors, mm. which was new to me. And these guys would be paid to basically put together rhythm sections. Oh, you know, they they were just another part of kind of the music bureaucracy because there was so much going on. Yeah, they kept they they made sure all the contracts were right. They made sure people were in the right places at the right time. And there was the the fellow that I met. His name was Frank DeCaro. I haven't probably seen him in 40 years, you know, um, but he was, he was booking me. And I told him, I remember I said, if a session comes up, please just book me. Hmm. And, and this was when I was in Nashville. And so every time that I would get a single session, I would get all my gear. I'd pay a porter 40 or 50 bucks to put it on the plane. You couldn't do that nowadays. Yeah. I mean, and then I'd get a rent a car, zoom back to the luggage thing, take all of it off, cart it all of the studio, do one session, stay in a hotel, do the same thing, or not even stay in a hotel, get the red eye back to Nashville. And there were a couple of times where I had demos the next day. And this I mean, is before you moved, moved to LA. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so I yeah. had, I had enough things that were kind of buzzing and you get a sense whether you're making a mark. And it was at this point that I told Sherry, I said, you know, I think we, there's a shot to get out there and make it, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm getting these calls. So we moved out there. We, we sat in the duplex for probably for about a month without me getting a lot of calls. I would go and make my phone calls down at the 7-Eleven on the corner. And I had my rack in, in, and I would just practice incessantly. And I remember one time my wife said, do you have to make those noises all day long? <laughs> <laughs> My I wife says the same thing to me today. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. She it was just series series a nurse by profession. So, and and I said, yeah, that's kind of how I think I'm going to make my living. So, but after that, it was like one of those things where it just snowballed and just everything happened. I thought I had no, I guess I had no inkling that that wasn't how it was supposed to happen. But I talked to some mm -hmm. other people later, you know, who who had to wait in line like you normally do. You know, good yeah. ten years. 
Yeah. And they were just as good as me. That's for dang sure. There's no, there's no, I mean, I, I knew that was the case, but it was just, you luck out and you also make hay when you can, you know? Wit, what did you take with you guitar wise and how did you find your way to Norman's Rare Guitars to buy the 63 Strat? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I had a Yamaha SG2000, which I still have. I bought one of those 16. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen those guitars, but. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I know actually, exactly what that is. They're actually pretty nice. I mean, they were made, they're, they're, they're pretty substantial, they're pretty weighty. I had a Jerry Jones. Um, custom strat that he made for me jerry jones mm. of nashville fame he, he, mm-hmm. he like emg pickups and I, I think those are my two guitars mm-hmm. and uh i had a little custom little pedal board that hooked up into a rack that never really worked right and uh i had a yamaha uh transistor amp i don't know what mm. they were called but and i had a mesa boogie so that's pretty much i had i'm, I'm sure what it was i probably saw luke and his strat and i thought I need something like that. I need I need a Wang bar on it. Mm-hmm, need a Floyd mm-hmm. Rose. So I went to Norman's because that was somebody told me that they had good guitars there. I saw a really nice Strat, and um, it was probably without a scratch. Mm-hmm. And I immediately took it to um, a guy that was in the back shop of a of a my cartage company, a guy named Andy Brower, who kind of became kind of the the it cartage during that period. There's a guy named Jim Tyler. In the mm-hmm. back of his shop. Do you know that name, Jim Tyler? Oh, I do. He's one of the biggest influences on me. I build, and so the reason okay. I started building myself was because of Jim James Tyler. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's 100%. it. So, so Jim, this was before he became James Tyler, really. Yeah. And he he was the guitar guy in the back of the shop, and uh, and I said, I look, I need you know, I need this thing to be that kind of guitar. And he said, What are you going to do with these pickups? And I said, I don't want them. So. <laughs> I was hoping you'd tell that part of the story because I'd heard that before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't I wanted I wanted to look cool, and I I also thought the black pickguard then it, it was had a white pickguard. So anyway, there's nothing about that guitar that was original except the neck and the body. And um, after I got done with it, and uh, you know, he put a mid boost on it. There's some uh, I don't. Uh, there's some kind of I think it wasn't made like that at first. I think it happened a little bit later. But I do. I wanted Seymour Duncan pickups on it, mm-hmm. and uh, I just found out, by the way, um, this month that it's a '64, not a '63. Oh, it's not a '63. See, I had that in my notes. I didn't want to get that wrong. There we go. <laughs> yeah, isn't that cool? I, all these years, I've been. I thought it was a '63, and um, uh, it was taken apart, and uh, they looked at the serial number. And in my, you know, you know, Tom Bukovac. Yes, yes, yes. Great, I know of great. him. Don't know him. Yes, absolutely. Huge fan. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a boy. He's a he's a powerhouse guitar player. But he not only is is he that, but he's also he's just a gear. He's, mm-hmm. he's a historian. He know, and he I think he looked at it. He, I think he saw it and said that's a sixty four. And I said nah, sixty three. You know, like I would know. And sure enough, no, that was the guitar, and 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 pretty much that guitar was. I mean, you know, I barely played any other guitars. I ended up buying more guitars and, you know, racks and all that kind of stuff. But I would say 95% of my work was was done with that guitar. First of all, I have to say this, and I told him if I ever talked to you, I would. But I don't know yeah. if you know the name Andrew Raharjo, but he actually, uh, your rack, what was all the pieces of it were left and headed somewhere for a dump, and he grabbed them all and he has restored the entire rack uh he even he even got with bob bradshaw to find out the original wiring for the switching system and everything and i did an interview with him and it was just he's one of the nicest individuals so shout out to andrew i just wanted to make sure that i i told you that i could send you videos of it if you're ever interested it's really cool but um when did the rack stuff start for you like did you build it a piece at a time before it became a refrigerator how much were you using in nashville before la what were kind of the early pieces and then how how did it kind of grow from there i don't remember that part of it Uh, probably uh, maybe a couple pieces made it but by and large that again that was kind of the uh, convergence you know when bob bradshaw started building stuff Mm-hmm. And um, I, I don't know, he, maybe he was doing stuff for, for Mike Landau, 
there was something that was happening, you know, and that was there. Andy Brower was kind of the hub for all this stuff. So mm. it was like, yeah, I'll take one of those. Yeah, that was it. It just started happening. I mean, you need, you need delays. I mean, I, I, about that time, I mean, some of the digital gear was coming out, the SPX 90 or something like yeah. that, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I was, I mean, if you're out in kind of the hot seat and everybody's got all this gear, basically it was the, the reason that stuff worked so well is because it, that was the eighties were a time when MIDI keyboards came in. It was mm-hmm. dominant records were dominated by these massive keyboard sounds and you needed guitar sounds that kind of worked on the periphery and, yeah. and it, and the more shit we put on things, the more it <laughs> spread it out and you could hear it, you know, yeah. a little guitar and an amp, which is basically what I play through now wasn't going to do the trick. Sure. And so, and, you know, you just look at what somebody else had and, and go, oh, I like the sound of that. And so, it, you know, you had delays going left and right. You had a bunch of choruses. I had a Dimension D, which is, you know, that did that thing. But I also had a, a knockoff of the Tri-Stereo. It was a songbird. Mm. I, I got it in Japan. You could approximate that stuff with all the all the stuff in the box these days, you know. I actually did it. We I did this 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 uh interview just recently you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And and I don't have any of that gear because of uh, said person that A- got it. Andrew's got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and uh I mean, haven't had need for it probably since the 90s, but it was kind of a cool sound for certain, especially that chorusy type thing. Yeah. And and so that was the only way to get it back then, and then there was, and also there's a combination of the um, of 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 the way I, we figured it out. It was also the mid boost that Jim mm-hmm. put on the guitar that when you would not bypass it, but you would just roll it off. Let's say mm-hmm. it yeah. still added a glassy texture to the pickups. So you put that through all that processing, get enough delays and and compression on the front end of it. It just kind of was everywhere, but. But but nowhere at the same time. And that, that was, series, yeah, and that series parallel switch and the ability that Jim figured out, like, yeah, yeah. Well, I got these hot stacks, and if we if we go from from go to parallel with a mid boost, it's like you can cut through fair lights and all the things that are in that mix, which ironically is what a lot of artists are trying to cut through right now in terms yeah. of the frequency, yeah. and it's. I, I just think James Tyler for me is such an innovator at a time that, like you said, wasn't a huge name, was working on bass guitars to begin his career, but was doing all this stuff before he was James Tyler. And, you know, the Billy Jean guitar sound was James Tyler. I mean, what 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 does James Tyler like mean to you in terms of what he did to your guitar and all that? Oh, oh everything you were saying, I had no clue of what that meant. I just, I just, I knew I liked the guitar and, and the stuff he put on it made it sound like it was versatile. Mm -hmm. I could do those, like those clean little parts. And then if I needed a solo, you know, just all of a sudden put it back into the humbucker pickup and, and, and roll up that uh, mid boost. It was like, it was the most versatile guitar. Plus it felt great to play the guitar. Mm -hmm. So everything he did. I mean, it was my, it was the universal tool that I used through the eighties. And then when I moved back to Nashville through the nineties in Nashville, because in Nashville in the nineties was basically not regurgitating, but really building what the eighties in Los Angeles did. So I had two decades yeah. of, of use of this guitar. Plus I, the, the band that I was in, in the uh, end of the eighties giant, that was the main guitar too. I just took it on the road cause it played really well. And it, so, so what he, James did to that, is is I mean it was paramount to everything that I did, and it, and it was just providence that I that I met him. You know, I mean, like I said, he was in the back of Andy Brower's shop, and ah. that was it. So go figure that. Good luck, right? Did you have fun when you had to do that interview with Mason, where it was like, I got to put this all back together again, whether it's fractals and plugins and like, is it fun to go back and go, all right, now how did I? What was the order of events there in that signal chain like to, to kind of redo it again? Is that fun? Uh, well, I don't know if I describe it as fun. It was fun doing that. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun doing that interview after I said I would do it. Um, uh, normally, I don't do interviews. I mean, that's just that's just my thing. I, I, it's not that I I don't have a I have no problem talking about it. I have no problem talking to anybody. I'm just not. Um, I don't even know how to describe it. 
I, well, I told you a minute ago, I've always felt a bit of imposter syndrome about guitar playing. I, I've just mm. never, it's, it's not, and it's not a lack of confidence as a musician. It's a weird thing. So I don't, I don't go towards this stuff like, 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 uh, you know, victory lap or anything like that. So sure. when I was about the eighties, I, I feel so, I feel, I felt when I did that interview, I felt so distanced from it, mm. obviously through the years. And then when I listened to what he wanted to talk about, I thought I didn't, I, I had no clue how to go about it. So I knew I didn't have the gear and I was too lazy to hook up all my amps in my studio to do that. So I just, I, I think it was, um, it wasn't guitar rig. It was another, I can't remember the plugin. That's, that's going to kill me if I can't remember it. It sounded great. Well, and it was just, there was some, you know, you'd go through a preset and you go, okay, well that kind of is a workable thing. Well, delays are easy, right? You just get them, mm-hmm. you, you know, the chorusing thing was a little different. So I think that I got a dimension D, you know, in, you know, in the box yep, and then yep. found another thing that kind of sounded like a try. And it, it, to me, this, that all that sound was two courses combined. Mm. It's it was always two courses. It was never just the one. I was going to ask because a lot of yeah. people have said a lot of what you and Mike and Luke did in the early days, but a lot yeah. of the, to get that big sound was not just the wet, dry, wet and all that, but yeah, it was this argument of was it two choruses or was it pitch shifting or was it pitch shifting with choruses? Yeah, and I've always wanted to ask you that as well because you have to understand that the two the two solos that I first heard that I knew was you along with the the radio mix of the of the White Snake. Here I go again, but was yeah. actually two Michael W. Smith solos. Emily was the first one, mm-hmm. and the very first solo I did on the channel was "I Will Be There for You," and I thought the sound and the phrasing. And you have to understand when grunge came out, it was like, well, I can do that with my practice amp. Right, I right. can't do what Dan's doing, or and I was a liner notes kid. I would sit in the closet with vinyl and just read who recorded this and who did mm-hmm. this, and that. So for me, I, when all this stuff came out, and of course I was a little late to the party. About the time you were bringing the rack to Nashville, I had an ADA MP1 and an SPX 90 and a Digitech 2120 and all the stuff that was, of course, you know, I sold them for nothing because no one wanted it. Now, had I saved it for today, you and yeah. I could just offload stuff. And, you know, it's interesting now going back because there's times with all this new technology with like a fractal axe effects that I can do a pitch shift at seven cents this way and seven cents this way. And I'm like, now, was that the sound or was it a chorus or was it both? And I've always wanted to ask you, what really was that, that, that tone? No, for the solo stuff, it, I'm, I'm assuming it was that SPX 90 with a little pitch shift on each side. I don't think yeah. I used much um, on solos. I mean, I, there were some distortion parts that I would use uh, a little of the chorus stuff. But for solos, no, it kind of thinned it out too much. Mm-hmm. And, and that was probably a rack, you know, it probably was that Marshall rack I don't the know JMP one, the VHT, and then a JMP one. Yeah, yeah. yeah there were those. You know, th- they were good distortion boxes, right? They were rack distortions. They they seemed to they seem seemed to sound good. I, you know, and I always sent that stuff through the amps. You know, through the power mm-hmm. amp and the amps. The clean stuff was always two courses. Interesting. Yeah, cool. and it wasn't as much. I mean, you know, I'm sure there were some some slight iterations of that, but but pretty much. The chorusy stuff was for the clean stuff, and then the pitch shift was a little bit for the for the lead stuff. And always the the beauty of that rack too that that Bob made sure. I guarantee it wasn't my idea. It was probably it was it was he was just great at that stuff. So you had your your, your power amp and whatever I had the power amp. It ended up being a VHT. I remember that or mm-hmm. boogie. It was boogie or VHT, whatever it was. It was a lot of watts, like two hundred watts, coming out of these little cube speakers, Pacific cabinets. Which again, I, I saw Mike Land. I had them all. Take those; those look great because they're small, you know, and they're stereo. Sure. Yeah, and they and they you load them with two hundred watt speakers, so they were they, they weren't going to break up. And then Bob did this thing where you also the engineers would take two direct outs of the rack. So the great thing was that on the pedal board on the, the switcher, right, you could turn those directs off because that would have sounded really really bad with the amp, you know, with the distortion, it would sound like a, a, a killer B, you know? Sure. So, so you could program that stuff. So you could go from this ultra clean sound. And I would, I remember like I, if, if, if you were doing parts within a record, if you weren't like overdubbing a specific part, if you need to go from a pretty clean sound to a distortion sound, you could articulate that right on the fly. As long as you had the directs at a, at a substantial level to mm. when you had the clean sound and made sure your preamp going into the the, the, for the clean sound was not that loud. So the, the balance between direct, direct being here, amp was like this. But then when you sit, hit that next preset, 
your preamp level going into the amp was up here. The, the Drex went away, and all of a sudden, mm. voila, you got a, you got an amp. So it was, it was, you know, all those technologies plus all the stuff you mentioned about the Jim Tyler guitar stuff, you were able to go from like zero to 60 pretty quickly. Yeah. And then with all the effects and the reverbs and all that kind of stuff, you know, it was, it was a, think about that time. That was pretty ahead of its time, you know? Yeah. And it was moving fast. I felt like the technology was just going like this and it yeah. was, uh, yeah. did you back to story time? Did you have a favorite session? Was there a session that you were like, man, I just had a blast with the people there and mm. not even so much just your performance, but just kind of the experience. Was there anything like that? By and large, I didn't have any really, I had maybe one or two really bad experiences. Um, all the rest were, you know, you know, pretty affirming. <laughs> people, <laughs> people, people, it was, you know, I mean, it was good. You know, I, I, I can't complain. I, I think probably what my my biggest dream was to play on a Boss Gags record. Mm. Only because, and that was only because, uh, well, I, I always thought Boss was great. Yeah. But the legacy of guitar players, that he, I mean, I, you know, I would have loved to play a Steely Dan record, but I didn't get asked to do that. So then maybe that would have been another one. But when Bill Schnee called me for Boss Gags, that was a big deal because of the legacy of guitar players that I had just followed through on those records. I mean, mind you, when I, you know, when I was in my formative years, this is embarrassing to say, but singers and the, the song, the lyrics, all that stuff was just a bridge between guitar parts. <laughs> I didn't listen to that stuff, and I didn't really care. And if, but I would remember who the artist was if they had good enough guitar players. My my worldview yeah. was like like this. I, I looked to the prism <laughs> of the guitar. Me too. Me too. Hundred percent. There yeah. you go. And it's yeah. and you get you get to the point where you you know th that was it. So Boz and and the fact that I got to here's the funny thing. I, I mentioned this to Mason. I, I I didn't even know about publishing back then. I, I, and I don't know how this came up, but. Boz heard some demos that I was writing, just some music. And he mm. said, hey, can we, can I take that music and, and write it? Yeah. yeah. So the, the main thing I did with these songs was make sure that I had a long enough solo on mm. each of these songs. That's all I cared about was the guitar solos. It's so sad to say that now. Well, actually, it's kind of kind of funny. But that was, you know, because I got this hang with Jeff Beccaro and Marcus Miller for about two weeks straight. Mm. And... um and there was there was one day that that um, we needed two guitar parts on one of one of the songs that I actually written, and Bill Schnee said, "Who would you? What? Who's your dream other guitar part?" And I said, "Well, Steve Lukather. That's an easy one." And Steve said, "Okay," and he came and you know sat down and played this guitar part next to me. And I, you know, it was just like it was like a kid in a candy store. It was great great times, you know. And then I you know I I got to do my my thing too. You know, I I don't want to give you the wrong impression like. Like that, I wasn't going going for. I mean, I was really very intense about being really good. So it, it wasn't like this. It wasn't like this dream scenario where I was just, you know, oh wow. No, I was pretty. I was pretty intentional about, shall we say, everything I did. I worked worked really hard. I listened acutely to what everybody else was doing. Like when I worked with Mike Landau or Paul Jackson Jr., anybody. I, I mean, I, I was taking mental notes all the time. Mm. And and being in rooms with these great other musicians that were not guitar players, I learned equally as much from them. You know, I mean, just I mean, everybody that I got to work with, all the drummers at that time. Um, you know, I just mentioned Jeff Beccaro, but John Robinson, of course, mm. um, Carlos Vega, Rick Morata. You know, the the list goes on. You know, I'm obviously forgetting names right now, but it was like a master music class of of the session greats of, of Los Angeles, you know? So, so it was, it, you know, to me, it was kind of akin getting a college scholarship and getting to play for, you know, like somebody like Nick Saban, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, yeah. not that I'm an Alabama fan in any <laughs> shape or sort. He just seemed like a good one to reference. How did you go from sessions to how did giant come to be? It is one of the ones that kids come to me all the time going, Hey, mm. could you tap this solo? Could you do this part? You can isolate mm. the rhythm part. It is a cult following uh, without question. And mm -hmm. like I said, I get requests all the time to not just do your session work, but giant, but how did giant come to be for someone? Like you said earlier, you didn't want to be out on the road. You didn't want right. to tour. How did giant happen? I ended up working so much. And so, mm -hmm. you know, with that, you know, all of a sudden maybe it's some entitlement as far as the entitlement, probably in that in that form was, I was just getting bored mm. and, and I was playing for a lot of rock bands also. And, 
and you just sit in there and you go, well, you know, I can do this. <laughs> and, it, and <laughs> but it, it didn't start. It started out as a band, um, a, a, a couple singers, Tommy Funderburk, who was a really famous session singer, and Tom Kelly, who was a famous session singer, but also a, a, a hit songwriter. Alan Pasqua, who was ended up being in Giant. Um, Mike Baird was the drummer. We just had this practice band. Denny Belfield yeah. was bass player. And um, I think that was it. And we we, we would always practice. Uh, where did we practice? There was some place in the valley. I'll think of it in a minute. But we 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 just started playing just for for a hoot. And the idea was these we'd just get a record deal with these guys singing. They were great. They could sing every note, you know, in the book. And it was like flawless. And uh, oh, we were practicing at REO Speedwagons rehearsal. You know, oh, wow. somebody knew somebody, whatever it was. So we'd just go and hang out there two nights a week and after our sessions and, and just drink beer and, and practice. And uh, we even took it in the studio a couple times. I can't remember the, who the producers were in those things, but you know, the stuff was OK. It wasn't great. It was just good. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the playing was really good and the singing was great, but it, there was just nothing that was cohesive. And somewhere out of there, Alan and I became really good friends and uh, we started writing a few songs. And so we do demos at, at, at my place or his place. And I said, well, I, I sang a little bit, you know, so I started singing. And, and one thing led to another. Some people heard it. We quickly filled in the band with my brother and Mike Brignardello from Nashville. And that was it. And we got signed to a record deal probably within a year. It was really wow. weird. Wow. And so, yeah. And so it was like one of those things. Well, it was such a blur. And, and, um, but it was fun because there was a musical outlet, you know, again, I could play guitar how I wanted to play and singing was just kind of like, I, you know, somebody had to sing, so I may as well do it. A funny note was after we cut our first record, we, we had a manager was a big time manager and he said, well, you guys got to go play live. And I had to stand in front of my mirror in, in the front part of my house with a, like a cassette tape of the record. Cause I think we still had cassettes then and learn how to play the rhythms while I was singing. Cause I had never really done that. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, why would you have if you were doing? Yeah. 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 So it. so it was, you know, it was fun. And I you know, I learned it and, and, and we went out. We were we were I'd say we were fairly capable live. I was not a great front man. I, I can't. I mean, I was watching all the front men of that the, that day. And, you know, I was not like the host of a party. I was just a musician. And so I could sing pretty good and yeah, I could play pretty good. But, uh, you know. I was not pick any of them. I mean, they were, they were all, you know, they were all these great party leaders and even if they couldn't sing. Right. And a lot of them could sing. So I was not that. So we, we were, we were good. We had, we had a good little following, had some hits, but I remember when the nineties came in, we had just cut our second record and it was like, I saw, I'll never forget what it was up a Sony. We were mixing up at Sony records in New York, Sony studios. And somebody showed me, uh, a Pearl Jam video of even flow with Eddie Vedder climbing up that little, you know, mm -hmm. that little theater. And I thought, okay, boys, we need to roll up the mats and go home because <laughs> <laughs> that's exciting. And compared to <laughs> what we're doing, it's not that. And so, but so it was a brief, it was a great time. It was for me, it was a transition time. And we also moved, Sherry and I also moved back to Nashville. We just had our first kid. And um, I thought I was never going to play sessions again and co woke up one morning in 91 and it was like, well, giant is not going to happen now. And so I had to, I had to re embrace uh, my session playing. And it was either move out to LA again or learn country music. And, and country music was kind of saying, Hey, come and do this stuff, do what you do. And you could, you know, you can kind of learn kind of as you go. And that's what happened. I heard that somebody was like, uh, no, bring your rack. And you're like, wait a minute, but I'm no, I'm doing country. Like, no, we want the LA rack sound. Was that how that went? Yeah. yeah that was well, in, in even backing up. I transitioned you out of LA really quick. You, you can, you notice that, but, um, <laughs> when I was in LA, because I was playing on some very high profile records, there were some Nashville producers, Tony Brown, which was one who was a, you know, legendary producer, Jimmy Bowen, same thing, legendary. They used to fly people from LA to, to play on Nashville records. And so I had my first little taste of it, learned, you know, I was, I was humbled by it. Number one, I remember sitting with a guitar player named Steve Gibson, who was legendary guitar player. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it just, and just feeling absolutely out, out manned, outgunned, 
not he was gracious as could be. And the, and the producer, I think it was Tony Brown. It was a Reba McIntyre record, probably in the late eighties. And I, uh, I probably alluded to the fact that I, you know, I'm not a very, I don't, I don't have any kind of grounding in country music, even though I grew up in Nashville. And he made it very clear. He said, he said, we got that. We got that covered. You don't have to do that. Just do what it is that you do. Hmm. And we'll incorporate. So that was, that was, and that ended up being, that ended up being it. I mean, literally as I got there and then there was another producer named James Stroud during that time period, who was a massive producer. He was doing, you know, a lion's share of the records in Asheville. Same thing. He said, if we want country, you know, if we want, we got, I mean, we got Brent Mason. Why, you know, we don't need anything else. Mm. And, and so as a result, I, during that time, it would be the equivalent of sitting with Mike Landau or Steve Lukather. I'd start doing sessions with Brent Mason. Mm. And so, you know, they, they, they just said, do you do your stuff? And Brent will take, you know, the, what he's, you know, undisputedly the, the best at. You just know? amazing. Just amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and he's, and he's not just one dimension. I mean, that guy can do anything, but, but so, and, but as a result, I got to sit down with him all the time and, and little bits come in, you know, and, and you learn how to do your version of that. And, you know, Brent would do the same thing. He would kind of have his version of, of kind of the way I played Brock music or, you know, all that stuff. So, you know, you, you learn how to, you, you learn how to, to cover a, a lot of lanes, even though that you, you're probably your specialty would be, you know, more limited. Yeah. And so that was it. And then, and then, and then when it really, no, it, it was, it was in gear, even in the early nineties, when Mutt Lang started doing his stint in Nashville because of his wife, Shania, that was kind of when it all kind of did, did that from a guitar player. But that was also the thing that kind of catapulted me into production. Yeah, that, I was which was ask, never even the, the deal, you know. I was going to ask, what was the quote I read? Somebody said to you one day, they said, you don't know this, but you're a producer. Was that Mutt that said that to you? Uh, That's probably my interpretation. He, he just, he, he pretty much just said, because we, we'd worked together. He was calling me in a, on a bunch of records and, uh, and, and he alluded to the fact, he, he just said, he said, the way that you go about coming up with parts, he, he understood that I understood what he was talking about and not just from the guitar standpoint. We, we were kind of mm -hmm. simpatico in that way. And he, he yeah, he, he really um, encouraged me to, to, to consider that. And I, at first it was kind of like, eh, I don't know about that. But, but he also then helped me get one of my first Nashville gigs as a producer. So, yeah, that was a big deal. But, you know, as far as I was concerned, that was it. The epitome, if you could work, play guitar for Mutt Lang, that was, I don't know who else. I mean, sure. Quincy Jones, you know, I mean, you know, they're, they're, you know, that that was the dream scenario as far as I was concerned. He was like, he did my favorite records. I, I just think it's so cool that you had this amazing career as a guitar player, as a session guitar player. This is speaking from somebody that was born a little too late because I was like you. I didn't want to be on stage, didn't want to be a front man, wanted to be a session player. Yeah. But it's pretty awesome that you had that amazing career and then this amazing career as a producer. Like, mm -hmm. And I let me just say this. I, I have to say this because I've heard you say it multiple times about the imposter syndrome. The amount of kids – Young people and older people that come to me all the time say, I can't play it quite like Dan did. That was just, I was too good. I got close or that I learned so much from this, or I never even thought about going here with that. I can tell you unequivocally the amount of volume that I get from people around the world of every possible age that have said you have are such a massive influence on their guitar playing. And I think mm. too, even more so now in a day and age where the guitar solo is coming back in to play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, people are like, well, who was great that did it? And they find you and they find Mike and they find Steve and they find that. And they, I mean, you don't have many kids that are like, I want a Dan Huff black classic at, at James Tyler or the yellow, you know, like <laughs> it, it is a, I mean, I, I see it on social media every single day. I mean, it, it is the influence. I don't Sweet. think you guys realize the influence that you've had on multiple generations of guitar players, like over time. And it just continues, you know, there's a, there's a 14 year old that's listening. Well, what was that? Well, I learned that. And then all of a sudden you've now influenced that and that bead goes off. And I wanted to make sure that I made that clear because the amount I hear every day, I can't wait to tell you guys this because I know you don't mm -hmm. see it necessarily, but I get emails from people in Indonesia and Spain and Germany mm -hmm. and, hey, can you tab the 
combustion solo and can you do this and oh i really want to learn dan's rhythm part on on this michael w smith song and oh dan did this one on a van stevenson record could you do that one and then it just dan it's every single day so i just i know you keep saying that but i just (laughs) wanted to say how much i appreciate what you did because it wasn't just me part of the reason that i invented this channel was i was like here's a group of guys that influenced every ounce of my guitar playing Mm. and if i can somehow give it back to the world and make it easy for people to play with tablature and guitar profiles and however kids want to learn and slow down the video then that's what I want to do. And so I just wanted to make sure I told you that before we were done. And, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to lose time and not a kiss ass moment. Just wanted to make sure I told you that it was, you know, it's, it's phenomenal what I hear every day about, about the work you did. So. It's, uh, I, I, I really appreciate that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very affirming and I, and I appreciate it more than, you know, that's, it's good. I mean, it's good. I, you know, it makes me, it, it, it does, you know, I, I'm not even on social media. Yeah. Um, so, so I, 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 ta- I tag you in the videos, but I have a feeling that Instagram account is not not in use. <laughs> no, that's not in use. No, no, it's yeah. not. I mean, you no, know, no. I, the only thing I have is YouTube. You know, so and that's because I can watch between cool guitar solos and then uh, uh, th- there's these videos about how to fold clothes, which I which I'm probably more obsessed with than anything. I never knew how to fold clothes. So. Anyway, but thanks. <laughs> That's, oh, that's, that's it. very kind. And, and, you know, funny thing is, I, I mean, I got, I, I love playing the guitar and I'm actually kind of learning some new stuff in, in my, you know, at this point in my career that I'm really excited. Uh, you know, I started writing some songs to, to record, which I, you know, people have been asking, I, people have asked about this. Why don't you put out a record? And I, it's never felt the need, but there, there may be something coming up here. I, I started writing some melodies and, and, um, Ooh, I love and I it. might muck around with some things. We'll, we'll see how it comes out. But, um, I, I, you know, I, but I just played a few solos. I, I, I work with this young artist who I, I, I really enjoy. He's, he's, um, his name's Kane Brown. He's, he's out of Nashville, but he multi-genre kind of guy. I mean, he calls it country music, but it's, it's really arena rock is what it is, you know? Mm. Um, but, but now you're speaking it. my language, Dan. Now you're speaking yeah. my language. That, well, that's what he, you know, he, and he likes the big solos and he's always saying, come on, Dan, play. Yeah, you know, like I played something, I don't know, a couple months ago and, uh, I thought it was tasteful and, and he was, he's not a guitar player, but he goes, no, like do that insane stuff. He doesn't say much. He's very quiet. No, make it crazy. I said, what? <laughs> So I, I sent him, I sent him about five or six solos. He was somewhere, you know, touring and, and he picked the most insane one that I did. I just thought it was, you know, on a lark and he, and I, all of a sudden, yeah. so, so there's some stuff that I'm, I was just actually working on a mix of it earlier today in this hotel room, um, uh, that I'm kind of, it's like kind of fun. It's like solos that if I heard them, I would go, mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe you'll hear, maybe somebody want to figure out that stuff. Uh, by the way, tablature, one of my son-in-laws is obsessed with guitar. He's, he's a periodontist. You know, he's really loves guitar and, and, uh, he's really learning, but he knows that he knows how to do tablature and he showed me something and I, I couldn't, I didn't have the slightest idea what it was. Well, you know what I'll do when we, and when, you know, we don't have to leave this in here or we can, it's cool, but I, I will send you over my site cause they, he can just download it's all free. I don't, I don't make a penny off this. Like it's all, I'm growing this YouTube channel. That's great. But like, this is all for me to give back what music's given to me, but it's a, it's a list. I actually have it down to the beats per minute, which makes it very hard to do things like combustion when it was in free time. It's like, I don't know what the beats per minute was on this. Like (laughs) there was no drum, but it is. What's What's combustion by the way? What is that? Do you remember the, your solo you did on uh, it was the giant record in Oh one. Do you remember that? That you played that kind of ripping. It, it's a minute and a half long, and it's just a solo with a bass. Do you remember that? It's on three. Yeah, it was on your the three record, Giant Three. It's called. Combustion. Are you sure it's? Are you sure it's me? Wouldn't that be great if we found out it wasn't me? Well, if it's not you, that's interesting. But I'm almost positive this is you. It sounds exactly. It, so I, if I say I, Giant I, and Combustion, well, let's see. Let's just try it here. This is fun. All right, let's just see. I'll tell you if it's me. You said that earlier, and I was sitting there thinking, oh, "Oh yeah, sounds like Tim McGraw records." 
That's, that's me. That's you. I figured it was. So that's been the new request for me to do. Of I've done about 17 of your solos now, and I do it all by by hand. And what's funny about that solo is there's no beats per minute, so because right. it's just you playing, it's free time. So in a musical sense, it's hard for me to, you know. Oh, so yeah. I had to I had to pick a BPM. To, but it's fun because a kid will get that. And I can see on my website when someone downloads something, and it'll be like, tonight you had seven downloads from Spain. Or I'll somebody, will, <laughs> yeah, and they come and they grab all. If you just go to sessionsolos.com, it's on right. my guitar build website, you'll see all the, the solos there. And you can. Well, um, that would have been helpful. Uh, well, other than I don't read tablature, um, the, uh, what, what I did that thing for Mason to learn some of those guitar solos. <laughs> I, I, tr- I, I remember, I do remember that combustion. I don't remember the, that that was the name of it. And yeah. I would, I would fess up if that was not me. I don't, it's funny because it's like it's all a blur to me. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what? These I think these were some like outtakes. Giant three was. Yeah, or something like that. You know, yeah. Because I wasn't with I was we didn't we didn't tour that. The, the only two that I really remember, but this makes sense. Yeah, this makes total sense. That's interesting because I saw that record release date was oh one. So yeah. were you saying these might have been recorded ten years prior and then they just. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna ask my brother. No, no, I mean, I, I and I, I remember these songs. I really liked the first record. I thought that was good. The second record, I thought was okay. It wasn't it? I, I thought the first record was probably better. But this one, this that makes sense. I, I totally get it now. Yeah, the, well, I think this, these were this, these this, were outtakes this, from the second record. This will make you smile. So Andy Wood, I know you know who he is in Nashville. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. He just did uh, your stay solo from the second record so on his youtube channel and it's like that's what i mean it just keeps it's just well that's i I did reference that mason sent that to me so i could figure out that one lick at the end of it yeah and i and i figured i figured it out i think i blew the lick at the end on the video that'll be fun some fun you can watch but i i got it pretty dang close up until that point that's awesome i yeah well it took me six weeks to get that done where i could record that on youtube yeah yeah yeah. last thing i was going to ask you is i know rich rankin from james tyler was there and how cool for him to kind of look at that guitar from back in the day uh that jim worked on and did he kind of take it apart and do some he had a picture yeah on his rich was the one who, who who told me it was a 64 Oh, it was. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He sent me a text. I, I, I don't know if he thought it was going to ruin my day. I mean, I, I was, I was, you know, I was, I, well, it's a 64. Good. Yeah. Learn something new. But no, he's, he's a, he's a dear guy. I really like that guy. He's, he is yeah. a boy. Talk about it. An enthusiasm for guitars. Wow. Oh, he just, he's so, and he's such a great human being. Yeah. I just think he's yep. such a, he's such a, a, a wonderful guy. Man, this has been a bucket list moment for me. If I don't do any more interviews on this channel, I'm I'm yeah. good. I uh, I'm such a huge fan of yours. I I can't Thanks. thank you enough for you've been inspiring me for decades on the guitar and about a hundred billion other people around the world every day. I know because I hear and um, I'm just so blown away and honored for, to have a moment of your time. I really am. It's been phenomenal, John. I, pre- I pre- appreciate it. it, it, it 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 uh, made my day, and it also takes me one step away from being so uh, hypercritical about doing interviews. This is a good one. Thanks.